potential. Now let's say that the neurotransmitter binds the other category of receptor, the metabotropic receptor. Metabotropic receptors are not ion channels. They are what's called G-protein coupled receptors. They're also sometimes referred to as seven transmembrane, transmembrane domain receptors. Because if we look at a neural membrane, on the outside of the cell, there's a binding site for the neurotransmitter, and then there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven transmembrane domains, parts of the receptor protein that cross the membrane. On the inside of the cell membrane, there's a G protein binding site. But when the neurotransmitter receptor is not bound to the neurotransmitter, that G protein binding site is not accessible. When neurotransmitter binds to the receptor, the first thing that happens is that the G protein binding site is exposed. Once the G protein binding site is exposed, the G protein can bind. The G protein is what's called a heterotrimeric protein. That just means that it is made up of three different types of proteins. They're called alpha, beta, and gamma. When the G protein is just hanging out in the cell, the alpha subunit has a GDP attached to it. That's guanine diphosphate. Now that DP means that it has two phosphate groups. When the G protein binds to the G protein binding site on the activated receptor, the G protein itself is activated. What that means is that the GDP is replaced with GTP. That means another phosphate group gets added to it. And when that happens, the G protein actually separates. So the alpha subunit with the GTP separates from the beta gamma subunits. So over here, we've got the alpha subunit with the three phosphate groups there, and then the beta gamma subunit. Now, this G protein can initiate what's called a signal transduction cascade, a series of molecular events with what's called second messengers and effectors. The messengers tell the effectors what to do, and the effectors do stuff. There is basically an infinite number of possible signal transduction cascades. Which of the cascades happens depends on a lot of other factors inside the cell. The most simple signal transduction cascade is that this alpha subunit goes to the membrane and binds to some other ion channel and causes that ion channel to open. Just like any other ion channel, once this channel is open, ions can flow in and out based on their driving forces. If this channel is permeable to just potassium, potassium will exit the cell. A positive ion leaving will hyperpolarize the membrane, and the name of this hyperpolarization is an IPSP a hyperpolarization caused by neurotransmitter binding to postsynaptic receptors. Now, if this ion channel is permeable to both sodium and potassium, sodium will enter, potassium will leave, and we already know that sodium wins because the equilibrium potential of a cation channel is zero. This would cause a depolarization called an EPSP. If this channel is permeable to chloride, that is, if it's an anion channel, sorry, then chloride will enter the cell. A negative ion entering the cell 
will cause the membrane to hyperpolarize, and the name of that hyperpolarization is an IPSP. Okay, so we said that the shortest possible signal transduction cascade was for the activated G protein to move from the receptor to a nearby ion channel and cause that channel to open. However, signal transduction cascades can also be much longer, involving a number of messengers and effectors, each arrow representing a step along the pathway. Signal transduction cascades can ultimately lead to changes in transcription and or changes in translation. This is because the signal transduction cascade can influence transcription factors that change which genes are actually expressed within the cell. Or it can influence uh, proteins that have already been produced to determine what happens to those proteins next. For example, you could recruit additional receptors to the membrane. Or a signal transduction cascade can tell the cell to internalize other receptors, remove them from the membrane. These signal transduction cascades can interact with other signals that are coming into the cell at the same time, ultimately leading to long-term changes in synaptic strength. The process of synaptic transmission is neurotransmitter released from the presynaptic cell talking to the postsynaptic cell, and the postsynaptic cell, via its receptors, hearing the presynaptic message. It's important that that message be confined in time. So the action potential is fired in the presynaptic neuron, triggering calcium channels to open, triggering vesicle fusion, and then talking to the postsynaptic receptors. As soon as that happens, we need to get rid of the neurotransmitter so that we don't continue to hear a message that's no longer being sent. There are a couple of different ways to get rid of neurotransmitter. One way is through reuptake. Many neurotransmitters have reuptake transporters. These use ATP energy to pull the neurotransmitter back into the presynaptic terminal, where it can be recycled and used again the next time the presynaptic cell fires an action potential and releases neurotransmitter. Another way of getting rid of neurotransmitter is through enzymatic destruction. These enzymes 